So I am in my library, which is all my books stacked on the stairs going up to the bedroom. And uh, I thought I'd sit here since there's all these books because I am going to talk about um, some of the ideas in this book, Practical Ethics by Peter Singer. And I made some little notes here to try and keep myself on track. Um, so let's take a look really quickly at the table of contents, just so you know what's in the book. Um, chapters are about ethics, equality and its implications, equality for animals, question mark. What's wrong with killing, question mark. Taking life, animals. Taking life, the embryo and fetus. Taking life, humans. Rich and poor, climate change the environment, civil disobedience, violence, and terrorism, and lastly, why act morally, question mark. And um, this was originally written in 1980 and was, was most recently updated in 2011. So actually, um, still pretty old. Um, I'm going to focus on talking about, for the most part, taking life. And um, so if you're not interested in hearing about dead animals, dead fetuses, dead babies, and dead people, please do not watch this video because, um, although I'm just gonna be kind of talking about this academically, these are obviously very personal um, decisions that we've, a lot of us have had to make in our own lives. And so it may not be the most comfortable thing to talk about. And so just a fair warning, I'm letting you know. Um, I really wanted to read this book because I initially read the book Animal Liberation by Peter Singer and I did a video on that as well as um, the book The Case for Animal Rights by Tom Reagan and um, this is the first time now this book was um, was published before Practical Ethics about five years before published in 1975 and most recently updated in 2009. So I thought that this book might give me some more information about a concept that he talks about in animal liberation called replaceability. And um, let's see here. And, and before I get into this, actually I probably should explain that Peter Singer is coming at this concept as a preference utilitarian. So I talked in my original video about kind of um, these areas of ethics, um, two major categories being deontologists and teleologists. And with the teleologists, we're usually thinking of them as like the consequentialists. Within that group, we've got like the different kinds of utilitarians. You have the more traditional, what's called hedonistic utilitarians who are focused on maximizing the amount of happiness and minimizing suffering. Whereas Peter Singer um, talks about preference utilitarianism because he, he's thinking in terms of like people who might actually want to suffer and um, for whatever reason. And if they do, that's their preference. And so we're not necessarily maximizing happiness. Um, and so, um, yes, so replaceability was that idea I was interested in that he ta had just um, talked about in kind of briefly and it wasn't very clear <laughs> where he fell on that um, concept in animal liberation. And he says, um, let's see, where am I at here? I'm just gonna read this whole paragraph to give you a really good idea what he's trying to talk about. The real difficulty arises when we consider beings not capable of having desires for the future. Beings who can be thought of as living moment by moment rather than having a continuous mental existence. Granted, even here, killing still seems repugnant. An animal may struggle against a threat to its life, even if it cannot grasp that it has a life in the sense that it requires an understanding of what is to exist over a period of time. But in the absence of some form of mental continuity, it is not easy to explain why the loss to the animal killed is not, from an impartial point of view, made good by the creation of a new animal who will lead an equally pleasant life. And then he goes on to say, it's still, I still have doubts about this issue. The preposition that the creation of one being should somehow compensate for the death of another does have an air of peculiarity. But it seems like when he's writing a few years later um, or updating this book, Practical Ethics, in its third edition, that he seems a little bit more comfortable with that idea of replaceability. And he says, um, 
When I wrote the first edition of Animal Liberation, I accepted Salt's view, and he's talking about Henry Salt and his ideas that he'd just been discussing. I thought that it would, was absurd to talk as if one conferred a favor on a being by bringing it into existence, because at the time one confers this favor, there is no being at all. But I have since changed my mind on this point. And so then he goes on to, um, to talk about um, this concept of replaceability and why he thinks that he's more comfortable with that. And so what I'm gonna do is talk about this concept as if it were a sound argument. Because um, one thing I like about Peter Singer is that um, in Animal Liberation, you know, he, he approached ethics very practically um, and how it uh, could apply to the real world. He talked about um, whether or not we should be killing animals and focused in on factory farming and um, experiments on animals. And because that is the bulk of animals that are affected by us. And then he also talks about suffering as a concept that you can use to decide whether you should or should not, um, uh, what your actions should be towards animals because he, he sees that animals as suffering uh, is not being morally permissible and less absolutely necessary. And so he's using these very um, practical ideas um, to make arguments, to make real changes. And so um, I wanted to see if his ideas seemed practical to me in this book, you know, is, you know, does it help us decide if and when we should be killing animals? And so um, he does clarify that um, he's not talking about killing of animals when it's, when it's absolutely necessary. So he says, um, da, 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 none of this discussion is intended to suggest that people who need to kill animals in order to survive, people living in poverty who are struggling to get enough to feed themselves and their families, or those living a traditional hunting and gathering existence should not do so. Uh, he said, um, so, so he allows for that. So we're not talking about that. Um, he also doesn't in his discussion about replaceability, he's not talking about factory farmed animals because as we, I already said, he has decided that it's not morally accepted, acceptable to use animals w that we don't need um, to eat because we can eat other things when they're suffering and he sees them as suffering in, um, in factory farming. And so his idea about replaceability really only applies then to a very small group of like say maybe small farms or homesteads where animals um, um, leave, lead relatively happy lives, for example. And um, so I don't know what is that because most of our food comes from factory farms. Um, animal experiments happen on all of these animals. So maybe we're talking about what, 5% or so of animals that this apply, the idea applies to. And even then, he's talking specifically about animals that would not be considered what he calls persons. And he defines that he says, is there something about the life of a rational and self-conscious being as distinct from a being that is merely sentient that makes it much more serious to take the life of the former than the latter? Um, to take the lives of any of these people without their consent is to thwart their desires for the future. For most mature humans, these forward-looking desires are absolutely central to our lives. So to kill a normal human against his or her wishes is to thwart that person's most significant desires. Killing a snail does not thwart any desires of this kind because snails are incapable of having such desires. And so um, so that's how he describes kind of a, a person, a, a person, you know, the definition, which also would include some animals, um, are those that kind of have a concept of themselves and of a of, of future and would would prefer to have that future. And so he goes into talking about different types of animals that might be considered persons. And so he talks about chimpanzees, um, like dogs and cats, possibly birds like blue jay type birds. Um, and then he says, well, and maybe if we're talking about birds, does that mean chickens? He talks about like even some 
fish. So like he talked about, like um, there's a hole in the net and the fish know where the hole in the net is. And a year later, they know where it's at. And so different things that would imply that um, or demonstrate that there are different animals and maybe even like fish and stuff that might be persons. Um, he does also say that we should, for those animals, we should give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe they are persons um, before we um, we do something like take their life. He says, um, if it is wrong to kill a person, a person, when we can avoid doing so, and there is real doubt about whether a being we are thinking of killing is a person, the best thing to do is to give that being the benefit of the doubt. And so he also talks about that there's kind of this continuum, uh, a degree to which one might be a person. Accepting these differences between normal mature humans and non-human animals, we could see the wrongness of killing not as a black and white matter, dependent on whether the being killed is or is not a person, but a matter of degree, dependent on, among other things, whether the being killed was fully a person or was a near person or had no self-awareness at all. And so um, it, it gets a little confusing because then he goes on to talk about some of these animals that he had said that might be persons based on um, evidence and then he talked about giving animals the benefit of the doubt. But um, for example, he talks about um, clams, um, you know, not having, they don't have a brain and um, they do have like um, uh, neural systems, but they don't like have a brain or whatever. Um, um, they have nerves. And then he talks about like, you know, he talked about the snail and I was kind of confused because he doesn't never gave any really evidence like has he looked into research on awareness of snails or is he just considering them that they're small and slimy and so that they must not be persons. So I didn't know about that. And then later he goes on to talk about chickens where he had um, previously said, well, they're birds and maybe we should give these animals the benefit of the doubt. He said, um, suppose that we can be confident that chickens, for example, are not aware of themselves as existing over time. And then he says in parentheses, and as we have seen, this assumption is questionable. Assume also that the birds can be killed painlessly and that survivors do not appear to be affected by the death of one of their numbers. Assume finally that for economic reasons, we could not rear the birds if we did not eat them. Um, then the replaceability argument appears to justify killing the birds because depriving them of the pleasures of their existence can be offset against the pleasures of chickens who do not yet exist and will exist only if existing chickens are killed. So this idea that um, human beings raise these domesticated animals, and if we didn't raise them, they, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't exist to have happy lives. And so, and they only exist because we kill them. And so um, that's why it might be okay. But now he had been talking about these chickens before, they talk about birds that might be persons and maybe even chickens, and maybe we should give them the benefit of the doubt, but then now, it's just confusing. And so um, as I read this book and I got to the end of the section where he talks about replaceability with animals, I didn't feel like he had given any direction about, well, well first of all, it's a very limited application. So why even talk about it? Um, you know, we're just talking about maybe small farms and homesteads um, where you would kill an animal where you didn't, you know, necessarily need it. You could have eaten something different, but, um, but they're replaceable because they're not persons, so you can do it. Um, and so then, so then, which animals are those? It's just really not clear. Is he talking about like, okay, um, not chickens? And he was just using that as just kind of some sort of way of talking about his concept. Um, or, you know, not not smart birds and and smart fish like salmon, but maybe, maybe we can, non-persons are chickens and anchovies. So um, it's, it, it is really confusing and it, it doesn't, I don't think, you don't come away from this knowing like, what should I do, what is right or wrong morally? And then, you know, one's animals that would maybe more be clearly non-persons like snails or clams, you get into a situation where those animals, when they're killed, they're cooked to death. So to what animals does this concept of replaceability actually apply? It's not very help to, helpful in practice.
So then he goes on to talk about how the concept of replaceability might apply to fetuses, babies, and some people. And um, he clarifies, you know, that he's not talking about fetuses, babies, and people that are wanted by other people um, because then you would be thwarting their preference to have that fetus, baby, or person alive. And so what he's talking about are essentially unwanted fetuses, baby, and people. And by that, I don't necessarily mean that, um, like say you have a relative in a vegetative state, it's not like that you don't want them. It's just that maybe you know that it's for the best because they're never gonna come out of coma and they're never gonna have a normal human life. And so um, he's talking about those individuals. Um, and so when he explains that, he explains them as being, those individuals being very much like animals that are non-persons. So he says, let's see here, um, we can look at the fetus for what it is, the actual characteristics it possesses, and can value its life on the same scale as the lives of beings with similar characteristics, which are not members of our species. And so then um, he also talks about, um, does it really matter if um, the baby is a fetus inside the uterus or outside? Uh, let's see here. He said the location of a being in sort of inside or outside the womb should not make that much difference to the wrongness of killing it. And um, I would say that um, in decision making about whether to kill a fetus or a baby, um, it, it might actually make a difference whether it's inside or outside the body because a fetus might affect a, the, a woman's health it's going to change the way she's socially um, viewed. And there's a lot of other things that involve having a baby in one's body versus not having one in one's body. But, um, but that's, um, but probably on the mo for the most part, and maybe he, his concept is right about that. I don't know. Um, page 168, uh, we're talking about vegetative adults. Uh, once it is clear that a patient in a persistent vegetative state has no awareness and never again can have any awareness, her life has no intrinsic value. And so, um, so we're, we're at that with that. And I would say, um, okay, so let's see. Then the other thing he's, he's talking about is, um, why do, um, like currently we want to keep like any fetus baby and, human alive, you know, um, there are some laws that, about, you know, abortion and things like that. But for the most part, you know, um, killing of babies, um, infanticide and euthanasia are not looked on um, as something that we should do as a moral good. And um, he talks about that being part of the idea of sanctity of life, which comes from the, he says, from the Christian religion. So in Western societies, um, that wasn't how it was viewed, like say in Greek and Roman times, but once Christianity came along, um, that that became the concept of how we deal with life. We are created by God. Um, so we are his property and to kill a human being is to usurp God's right to decide. And so it's interesting because, um, probably at that time, human beings and babies would not have survived some of the things that they survive now because of modern medicine. And so that they, in some ways, looking at, well, God took them um, sort of thing might have been a way of looking at it. But now that we have modern medicine that can keep a human being alive that wouldn't have lived, it, um, it complicates things because now should we re be responsible for taking that life? Um, that would have died if there wasn't modern medicine to keep them alive. And so, um, but he's just kind of giving an, uh, his idea about where we get this idea, because otherwise wouldn't it be better to um, end the suffering of um, a baby or an adult that's in that sort of situation or in the life of an uh, individual that's not gonna have any sort of human life. And when I'm talking about that, I'm not talking about like say um, disabilities of people who lead um, happy lives, you know, um, we're talking about like maybe some, a baby for like brain dead or something like that, or a vegetative human or something like that. Um, uh, 
it's interesting. I have a friend who's a nurse and she worked in pediatrics with, with a lot of babies and she's against abortion. Um, but even her, she said to me that in her words, um, some of these babies um, should be given back to God. And so even a person who would think that a healthy fetus sh shouldn't be aborted um, was thinking that some of these babies um, should be given back to God. Um, and I do think that there is a difference between a, a fetus or a baby um, that we know might have a future and an adult who has, is now in a vegetative, a vegetative state and will not come out of a coma or whatever. Because in that case, that person really does not have any more future than to exist um, and be fed, um, you know, and maybe even breathe manually through modern medicine. So Peter Singer brings up this other idea to bolster his um, ideas about the concept of replaceability. And this is that, um, you know, should we in our actions now, when we're considering um, whether it's good or bad, consider the existence of future beings. And so, for example, he uh, uses the idea of like global warming. And if we um, make change, if we as a society and individuals make changes now, that will make the lives of future existing beings better. And if, on the other hand, we do nothing or we actually make it worse, then the, we know that the future existence, lives of existing people will be worse. And so if we're gonna make a choice of, you know, um, the preferences of these exist future existing beings, then we would pick the one where um, we make some changes to make it better for them. And so here we are kind of considering our actions and whether they're right or wrong on how they impact beings that don't even exist right now. And so that he um, ties into his ideas on um, killing of fetuses and babies. So he's saying, okay, if a woman has, is pregnant and she aborts that fetus and then she gets pregnant again, she's simply replacing the one baby with the other. And so there's nothing this wrong here. You've got, so like example is that, um, you know, this one baby or the one fetus is, um, severely disabled, but not, it wouldn't be miserable. It wouldn't suffer in its life. And then um, you've got this possibility that, that you could become pregnant in the future and have a baby that was completely healthy and had no disabilities at all. And so killing this one would be, would be better and allowing the, the one that would have these, would have more preferences, would be happier, um, would be, would be a better decision to make. And so what I wanted to do now is um, up until now, I've been kind of just assuming that this argument is sound, but as I was reading through it, there were some reasons that made me think like, this doesn't sound very logical and there's a problem with this. And so I kind of wanted to go through each of those things. And the first thing that I thought about was that, um, ethics is our principles that help us, you know, a system of principles, there are various ones, um, that help us decide what, how our actions, if they're right or wrong. And so we as human beings um, know that a non-person animal is happy in its life, like even a worm, like it's going through eating these little dirt things or whatever. And um, we know that the next day it would be happy doing its little things, eating this little dirt stuff and whatever. We know that even though it may not have that kind of concept of a future, an existence in a future. And with uh, fetuses and babies, unlike vegetative humans, a vegetative human wouldn't have ever have the possibility of a, a future. Um, 
and they wouldn't even really, I wonder if they would even exist on the level of a, of a worm as far as experiencing and that sort of thing. Um, but definitely a fetus and a baby, we know that they have a, a future. And so it doesn't, even though they don't have any concept of, of that at, at that stage. And so when we make decisions for, to, to is, are, is this right or wrong, what we're doing, uh, the actions that we're taking, I think that we have to take um, those futures that we know are there into consideration when we make those decisions. And so I just think that, that just kind of like, oh, oh, well, they don't know, so it's fine. Even though we know is, yeah, I just don't, I don't think that we can discount that. And so I was also thinking that, yes, maybe this concept of, of, um, being aware is one existence over time and, and, uh, and a desire for living in the future and things like that. Maybe that could apply in, in a decision making where like you're having to make a decision about, I'm going to starve to death. I need to eat this worm or this deer. And, um, knowing that the deer has more of a kind of a self-awareness and maybe what it's going to do tomorrow or something like that. And so I'm going to, I'm going to eat the worm and the worms instead of the deer, because that might be a better decision based on um, the preferences of that animal. Um, <clears throat> also, it, it seems like when you're making a decision with a mother who has a baby that is going to, that would kill her if she continued with a pregnancy, that you would just, it would be part of the decision making that we're gonna save mother because mother is aware of her existence and her place the past in the future, where is the infant or the, the baby doesn't, doesn't. And so I think that in, in that situation, it might make sense to take those things into consideration, but to, but, but to not um, include um, our knowledge of their futures, the animals and the um, fetuses and babies, I think is, um, you know, we, we just, we can't ignore that. So now if we look specifically to animals, and considerations in this concept of replaceability. What really struck me is this idea that human beings replace animals, are the ones replacing these animals. Um, because in fact, the animals themselves are reproducing and producing offspring. Offspring, you know, at most, you could look at human beings as kind of like matchmakers in that they bring these animals together, but it is the animals themselves that um, that produce the offspring. So to say that we're replacing the animals is, um, is a little odd. Um, especially that, um, it's not like, so, cause it was like, we're saying, okay, but well, they wouldn't be there if we didn't eat them and want them and eat them and kill them and, and do this whole process. But if they were gone, it's not like wild animals wouldn't be there in their place. It's not like um, because we've taken these happy domesticated animals away that there wouldn't be wild animals living there. And in fact, wild animals are would be more suited to the environment that they're living in because in a lot, a lot of cases, the domesticated animals would not be able to live without the care of human beings in those environments. Um, I was just thinking about like that sheep that was all over social media that had grown its hair so long and, and it was like not well and it couldn't get along. It's because we breed the sheep to continually grow hair so that we can cut it to make sweaters. Um, otherwise it would just grow its hair for the winter to stay warm and then it would shed it in the spring. And um, so, I, you know, even that question of is it ethical to um, br to breed these animals to to be these matchmakers that bring them into play so that that they become creatures that can't even exist in the environment that they live in, and um, so yeah, in in fact, the wild animals that that are more suited to that area would be happier animals um, than uh, they. I mean, they would be happy animals, even if there weren't domesticated animals there. There's just this assumption that there wouldn't be animals if human beings weren't breeding them into existence. It seems a little strange to me. And um, 
also just the whole idea that that you're replacing one with the other, that even is their offspring, and so there's a mother and then has a baby. There's actually two, there's two beings at the same time. The mother has the offspring and they exist together. Um, one has not replaced the other. Um, so you could only look at that concept as if you had some sort of fixed um, region or area where these animals existed and you artificially decided that there's going to be a limited population and then you could say well this one had another and so to can maintain this this same population we're going to take this one away um because otherwise what you have is you've got a mother and a creature and they're both happy animals together at the same time if you kill one you're reducing the happiness in the world or preferences in the world um because you've you've killed that animal and um, so it's interesting because he does talk about this specifically because in his ideas that, well, it's not okay usually to hunt. And so he talks about a duck, um, nor does it normally justify the killing of wild animals. A duck shot by a hunter, assuming for the sake of the argument that the ducks are not self-aware and that the shooter can be relied on to kill the duck instantly was probably leading a pleasant life, but the shooting of a duck does not lead to its replacement by another. Unless the duck population is at the maximum that can be sustained by the available food supply, the killing of the duck ends a pleasant life without starting another and is for that reason wrong on straightforward utilitarian grounds. Um, so yeah, we've got, um, he's decided that they've got this endless range or a range at least large enough to um, that they can continue to increase their population. So what you have is you've got duck mom and three little ducklings and they're all these four happy creatures. And so if you kill one, you've just simply killed a creature. But that's all um, based on this um, artificial constraint of the of the of the argument and so he does in that case he says so it, you know if animals have lived wild animals have lived beyond their range then it might be very similar to the domestic situation where it would be okay to kill them so he says when that is the situation it seems that a consequentialist cannot object to the deer being killed to do so would require holding that we are responsible for the deaths we inflict but not for the deaths that nature will bring about if we do nothing. My objection to that is that, again, you're in a situation where these wild animals, um, uh, there's the natural selection that allows the, their communities to be strong and be able to exist in the environments that they exist. And so if we're arbitrarily saying, okay, there's a hundred deer and you know, t because there's too many now, they're not gonna have food, they're gonna starve. We need to kill 10 of them. You're gonna just kill 10 deer. Um, whereas those 10 deer may have been the ones that were able to survive through a winter and there were other ones that weren't able to. And so you are um, affecting their community by your actions. Um, and I would say that's probably not ethical. And so, um, um, just this, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't seem these, these, this decision-making doesn't seem to be good decision-making making. And I think this, it does feel like there's artificial constraints on these, these ideas in order for them to maybe, maybe they'll work this way sort of thing. So then there were some, you know, human considerations in his um, concept of replaceability where he has these ideas um, that didn't seem, to, they didn't make sense to me. And um, so again, he's saying that, you know, um, aborting a fetus or infanticide are fine. It's no different than if you were to um, kill an, a non-person animal um, because they can simply be replaced by another one that would be happy. So it doesn't matter one way or the other. But this was confusing to me because it seems to assume, and he always seems to assume that there's going to be another baby. So what is the situation then when, um, is it okay to abort a fetus as long as the mother plans to have another baby, even if in the future she isn't able to or does decide she doesn't want to? Does that still make that abortion fine, even though that is, the baby was never re isn't replaced? And then like also, what if the mother aborts the fetus knowing that she's like, you know what, I'm just not gonna do this in the future. So is she wrong then to abort the fetus 
because there's going to be no replacement. Um, so then I also had, um, seemed strange to me that he was talking about, okay, so the killing of a fetus is really no different than the killing of babies. Just one is inside the, the uterus and one is outside of it. But then I thought to myself, like, um, you know, of course we're always talking about unwanted, um, fetuses and babies, not ones that mothers and fathers want because that's would be their preference and we don't want to thwart the parent's preference but what if we have a parent that says i don't want to have my girl, girl baby i want to try again for a boy baby and so um i'm going to go ahead and um, kill this baby i didn't know it was a girl i had the baby it's a girl and so i'm going to kill it because i want a boy baby um it should there should be nothing wrong with that because you are going to replace this what would have been a happy creature with this or baby with this other baby that's going to be just as happy or happier because it's a boy in a, in a society where boys are valued. Um, and he does bring up the idea that, um, well, that's not a big deal because like the difference with a fetus and a baby is that a baby can be adopted. And so let's look at what he has to say there. Um, he said, Thus, infanticide can only be equated with abortion when those closest to the child do not want it to live, and we talked about that, as an infant can be adopted by others in a way that a pre-viable fetus cannot, such cases will be rare. But then he's not taken into consideration that if this um, person is aborting the fetus because um, boy babies are preferred over girl babies, who in that society is going to want to adopt a girl baby? And... Um, and, and also it doesn't take into consideration the fact that if you had just waited with the fetus a little bit longer, it would have been a baby and it could have been adopted. And um, so um, obviously when, you know, somebody, somebody decides um, whether to have a uh, abortion or um, kill a baby, there are a lot of different um, scenarios and, and criteria that you have to take into consideration when making those decisions. Um, uh, you know, I was just thinking that like, um, you think, well, why would infanticide ever be allowed? But I was thinking of the book Beloved by Toni Morrison, where, um, uh, the mother kills her baby, which I, I believe was based on a true story that the, the, uh, the fiction was based on a true story. And, uh, she kills her baby because she didn't want it to, um, live in slavery. Um, this is in the United States during slave, slave times. And so, uh, you know, there are considerations when a person is making the decision to have um, an abortion or to kill a baby. Now, of course, in these times, we don't allow for um, uh, legally for killing a, a baby, um, you know, unless it's like on a feeding tube or something like that. And, and so that's a decision by the parents. But um, yeah, so anyway, I just thought it was kind of curious. Um, that he he talks about this and um, and there doesn't seem to be an explanation for some of these difficulties with his argument. So I'd like to sum up by talking about what I think is a critical element and where I'm having a problem with Peter Singer's argument um, surrounding taking life. And that is with the necessity or the lack of necessity um, in our decision making when we're taking life. And so this is a section here where he talks about a situation where it would be necessary to take life. And he says, if cows, pigs, chickens, and the other animals, animals we usually eat are self-aware, they are still not self-aware to anything like the extent that humans normally are. For this reason, he goes on to say, when there is an irreconcilable conflict between the basic survival needs of animals and of normal humans, it is not speciesist to give priority to the lives of those with a biographical sense of their life and a stronger orientation towards the future. And so separately, he talks about this smaller group of what he calls non-persons that don't have an orientation or awareness of the future. And in that case, he says, even if it's not necessary to kill them, we can because they don't really care. And I had said that because we know that those beings would be happy to live the next day and the next day 
we know that they would be happy to live in the future. Um, and so we do need to take their futures into consideration when we're making that decision. Is it necessary? I think that we should still um, consider whether it's necessary to kill non-persons. And so that means that, you know, the animals aren't just replaceable one with the other, that we should look at the one animal in um, specifically as it's living and consider and take into consideration that we know it would be happy the next day and the next day to live when we're deciding should we kill it or not. And the same thing with humans that are non-persons that um, like in the case that Peter Singer had um, talked about where there is the um, fetus that is severely disabled, but if it were to live, that it would live a comfortable life. Um, we should take into consideration that it would be happy living a comfortable life along with all the other criteria that we would make in deciding, do we kill? And so that would mean, do um, the parents, can they afford to raise such a disabled child? Um, would they be happy raising a, a, a child disabled to that extent? And all of these other considerations that go into deciding, um, is it necessary to kill? We shouldn't just say they don't know. So it doesn't matter whether it's necessary to kill or not. And I also was thinking that if we're in so many situations where we're running into irreconcilable conflicts between the needs and wants of animals and normal humans, then we should consider that perhaps we have a we humans have a population problem because, you know, Peter Singer talks about situations where animals are in a range that can no longer support them. And so um, shouldn't we also be thinking about that in terms of human beings? Um, and that if we're running into these situations all the time or we're having to make these decisions between is it them or us, that perhaps we have lived, we're living outside our range. And um, we need to think about that.